Okay, which verses refute purgatory? Be your muted, Luke. Okay, thank you. All right, Ben. Uh, ben, would you go first on that one? Okay, well, uh, which verses refute it? I'd say what verses uh, support it. Um, again, it's a, it's a completely man-made construct. I don't see it anywhere in Scripture whatsoever. So, um, I would first, uh, 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 you know, turn it around and say, well, well show me what verses support it. Uh, there's, uh, there's, and, and there's, I would say there's nothing, well, I'm not so much say there's nothing, nothing that immediately comes to mind personally for me that would say, oh, it, it, refutes its existence, but it, I could say, you could say, well, what, which, uh, verses, uh, refute that there's, uh, you, uh, purple unicorns, <laughs> it's, it, 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 it just doesn't touch on it, so, anyways, um, you know, again, what, what would be the perp, I would say this, what would be the purpose of, um, and I'm sure both of you guys would do a good job refuting, finding the verses that refute it, but, um, I would just say in general, what would be the point of it, um, because, the you know the the all the only I guess the purpose people say is for purgatory is it would it would purify and purge uh, the sins from unbelievers first before they before they could be ready to accept Christ or or they would it's a punishment for them so they'll wake up and realize okay um, you could be believe and be born again um, but again once you've died Christ made it clear to to Mary that. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, paraphrasing, but he basically says, "He who who lives and believes in me shall never perish." So it, the wording there, it's in John. It, the wording there is that you only have this lifetime to believe. There's no second chance. Um, you're only it's only this life that you have uh, that that chance to believe. And I think that verse in John where he says, "He who lives and believes in me will never perish." He emphasized that while you're living, you have to believe. Um, but also, too, like, again, what would be the purpose of uh, purgatory? Um, God's given all the evidence uh, in this life for everyone to believe. Uh, Romans says that clearly, that they're, they're without excuse. So people reject Christ willingly. Uh, they're without excuse. And so uh, what would what would be the purpose? You know, um, the, for a believer, we know that there's plenty of verses that say um, that uh, God does allow trials in this life to, I believe, to, to, for us to grow, to build our faith and to, um, and mature our faith and to, and to grow. So for example, we were talking about this on, la on last Friday fellowship, uh, one verse, a couple verses that came to mind for believers. again, this is for believers, uh, uh, that therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character hope. So again, it's there to build our, uh, build, uh, grow us in this life so that we can be, uh, Good representative representatives and ambassadors for Christ on this earth, and also an opportunity uh, for uh, abundant reward in 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 eternity. And then First Peter one uh, verses six through nine says, "In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that, that perishes." Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, the closest thing I see in the Bible that people that that uh, kind of uh, is equivalent to what people consider purgatory uh, would be the Great Tribulation, um, where again, it, it, it you know people often say that purgatory is for unbelievers. Not believers. Again, anyone's arguing believers need some kind of uh, purging or pruning or or whatever. That's all done in this life. Uh, that's our. We have to have that opportunity. God gives us in this life. It's a tribulation to grow us. So for there's no there's no reason for it beyond um, this life because once you're righteous, you're righteous. You don't need any correction. Um, so. Again, so are they going to argue this for unbelievers? Uh, what we, again, what would be the purpose? God says that they all are without an excuse. 
So, you know, the closest thing I, could, I see in Scripture related to purgatory would be the Great Tribulation, which basically I see has had three purposes. The first purpose of the Tribulation is to make an end of wickedness and the wicked ones. So, if, for example, in Isaiah 24, uh, verses 19 through 20 says, The earth is utterly broken, the earth is rent asunder, the earth is shaken violently, the earth shall stagger like a drunken man, and sh shall sway to and fro like a hammock, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Uh, and then the second purpose would be for worldwide uh, revival. So, Revelation 7 talks about the 144,000 Jews uh, being sealed, and I believe they're, I, they're, they're, they're going to go out and basically they're going to be 144,000 uh, John the Baptist types, essentially, and they're going to evangelize the entire world. And then the third purpose of the tribulation is to break the power or the stubborn will of the Jewish nation um, because it says that tribulation will not end until this happens. Uh, God's intends to break the power and the, uh, the holy... Basically, God uses the tribulation to break the uh, the stubbornness and the and the and the stiff neckness of His people in order to bring about national regeneration. Um, Ezekiel twenty says that God will uh, well. Ezekiel twenty draw, draws a simile to the Exodus. So after uh, get, God gathers the Jews from around the world, He'll enter into a period of judgment, basically the tribulation with them, and the rebels among the Jewish people will be purged out. Uh, by that judgment, and then a whole new nation, a regenerate nation of those who only believe. That's why Romans says all of Israel be, will be saved, because, again, uh, they will all be believers at that point, and then they will be allowed to enter the, the, the promised land, so to speak, which is um, the um, the new Jerusalem, uh, or I'm sorry, the, I, I consider that the millennium under, under uh, Jesus, uh, under, under his reign. So I, I just don't see a place for it in Scripture whatsoever. I think it's a man-made construct, wishful thinking. Yes, it is. <laughs> exactly. Brother Luke, can I go next? Yeah, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. I was laughing because it's like asking for something to refute something that's not in the Bible. <laughs> it's like, are we unicorns? Yeah, it's not there. There is nothing about purgatory in scripture. And let me tell you, purgatory is damnable. You know why? It denies the efficacy of the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's look at the word purge. Purgatory means place of purging, right? So the Catholics say, well, it's for people that still have sin on their account. And so fire purges them of their sin. What does that do? It denies that the blood of Jesus purged their sins. So let's look at Hebrews and see what they say about it. Who be in the brightness, this is Hebrews 1.3, brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of majesty on high. So what purged our sins? Jesus's sacrifice by himself purged our sins. So when you say uh, there's this place between heaven and hell, and it is for believers, Ben, you know, the, the Catholics believe that some believers will still have sin on their account. They didn't confess or they didn't do penance or something. And, it, and they have to burn off the sin. All it's saying is Jesus's blood didn't purge their sins. That somehow how we live our own righteousness uh, gets us to heaven. And if that righteousness isn't enough, then here's the uh, place you go to pay for your own sin until it's burned off. It's heretical and it is not in scripture. Now I can show you some places like in 1 Corinthians 3 where they mix it up when the works are tried by fire. But people aren't thrown in a fire to burn their sin away. The works are tried by fire to determine if they have reward or suffer loss of it. That's it. So there is no purgatory because that means a place of purging. When we're told in Hebrews that Jesus by himself purged our sins. And then he sat down because he was done. It was finished. 
So purgatory denies that. It's an insult to the suffering of Jesus. It's another way to uh, bring in pagan belief systems into the early church. But it is not in the Bible. Uh, I believe some of the reformers came against purgatory as well. So in Hebrews 9, 27, it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So once you die, there's the judgment. The judgment seat of Christ takes believers and their works are tried to see if they have a reward or suffer loss of it. We see this over here in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians 5 talks about how we're going to be clothed in a resurrection body. That we must all, uh, let me see, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to answer in the body whether what we did, good or bad, right? I'm looking for the, the verse. Let me see. For we must all before appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he is done, whether it be good or bad. Okay? So every person saved is determined their reward or loss of it. The lost appear before the great white throne judgment uh, to determine what happens to them. Uh, they will go to the lake of fire. And it's based on what they've done in their body. Uh, it's the judgment. There's no in-between. That's You're either in Christ, he purged your sins by his blood, and you trust in him and you're saved, or you don't. So there, there is no middle place. Now, the, the only place they could uh, try to make it sound like it's purgatory is in 1 Corinthians 3, when it says, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he's built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. But that's not purgatory. The person isn't thrown in the fire. His works are. They're weighed by the fire of God, his judgment. So, no, there is nothing, no purgatory. Jesus is the one that purges, which is what purgatory means, a place of purging. But Jesus already purged our sins with his blood by himself purged our sins. So it's actually heretical and denies the uh, sufficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus. It's very insulting as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Well done, sister. Uh, uh, as far as I know, there is no other Christian sect that uh, teaches and believes in this concept of purgatory apart from Roman Catholicism. Uh, so it's a, it's a, a man-made uh, construct. Uh, and I believe, of course, Roman Catholicism, a lot of things that they did were designed to milk the people of their money and their wealth so that a, you know, if you have family in purgatory or if you may go to purgatory, buy these indulgences and you'll, it'll get you out of purgatory. Uh, so really, I think that was the reason behind it. And what, how did they come up with it? You're exactly right, Renee. Uh, that's the only verse in the Bible that could be twisted in a way to come up with that. But uh, you, uh, you refuted it perfectly. Um, uh, but that's where they got it. That's the only verse that they can cite to try to support their, their heresy. Uh, but to me, uh, you can refute and try to refute a verse, but... You know, my my default is always let's let's rely upon what the Bible clearly states. And if it states something clearly, and then it repeats it over and over and over and over and over again, then we can be confident that that's the truth. 
And I'm referring to the fact that the Bible tells us that there's only two destinations. There's only two uh, uh, final outcomes. And uh, look at John 3.16. Everybody knows that. That's a perfect example. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you see, these are the two possibilities. You will either have everlasting life if you believe in Jesus and receive it, or the other, the other outcome will be you will perish. It doesn't say that there's a three possibilities that uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, if you didn't accept the Jesus as a payment, you can pay for your own sins uh, and, and, and burn and suffer in purgatory for a while and then get out. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but it does say there's two outcomes. Um, John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So let's repeat it again. You see there's two groups, a group that's condemned and a group that's not condemned. Uh, of course, we know we got the wide road that leads to destruction, the narrow road that leads to life, two possibilities. To, to, and uh, so over and over again, the Bible tells us that there's only two outcomes. Uh, you'll either um, be destroyed uh, or you will have life everlasting. There's not a third possibility according to the Bible. And the verse that they use to teach it is certainly being twisted. Uh, if you're going to develop some doctrine that's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, unorthodox, heterodox, it's not the no normal position, you certainly ought to be able to show us a verse that actually clearly states something instead of something that's ambiguous. But I think in context, it's clear what uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3.15 that Rene just taught uh, about. Uh, it's clear the, the context, what that's referring to. Well, okay. Right. Yes. I wanted to say it is, I mentioned it, but I, didn't, I wasn't clear. It is a pagan doctrine. It was very popular with Plato and Greek philosophers. They believed in an afterlife where people's sins or crimes would be paid for in the afterlife through some sort of torture or pain. And so uh, that can you can quote here this thing that uh, Plato says, um, uh, talking about uh, the Elysian fields and everything they must suffer for uh, whatever crimes they committed on this earth. Right. And then guess what? It was a huge money making scheme for the priest in Egypt, Greece and Rome. All the pagan priests would get tons of money for people to put if they, they told them their loved ones would suffer less in this place if they would donate large sums of money. So these pagan priests would get a lot of money. The Catholic Church did the same thing pay for masses done for the dead to get them out of purgatory. It is pagan. It came in through paganism. It has nothing to do with biblical Christianity at all. Yeah, I liked how you emphasized the point. Uh, I, I, I forgot my main point. Uh, I, I completely forgot to mention it, and, but you did as well, that it, it is it is heresy, absolutely, without a doubt, because if, if you're going to say it's for believers, then you can say, like you said, Renee, you're saying Christ didn't die for all their sins, so God's punishing them in heaven uh, for, for for their sins. So Christ didn't purge their sins, Christ didn't pay for their sins fully. Uh, that, so that's obviously uh, a, a heresy. But also to say that uh, if it for unbelievers are in there, that it's like, okay, well, God's punishing them for their sins so that they will eventually, but he'll give them another chance to believe in the future. Well, again, that's still double jeopardy. It means God put their sins on both them and on Christ, and he's punishing uh, the sin twice because, because uh, again, they're eventually going to, if they're eventually going to believe, then their, their sins are paid for, for by Christ. Um, so either way you look at it, it's heresy. And um, I know there's a lot, a lot of sophistry, especially lately I'm hearing, of people trying to make that work um and i don't know what you know they try to use semantics or try to explain it not maybe not call it purgatory but if if you're con if you're condemned in the afterlife and punished for your sins that uh, again that's heresy because christ paid for that for those sins and if you're in christ then uh you're one with him and you you, you can't you can't go to hell so it is absolutely a heresy